Chapter 13, Divided and Undone. When one attempts to figure out what is going on, why our society is or has fallen apart, why the fabric has come undone, when one looks at the different threads in a pile on the floor at the broken loom, such a person might become overwhelmed trying to piece the puzzle together about how this happened. Because there is not just one cause or even a few intersecting causes, there is simply a ball of threads all touching one another. Some pundits may try to talk about a web of causes, but there is no web, no seeming order to the plot. There are only individual threads pulled from the fabric and placed in a pile. It is a picture of division and chaos, not one of a multifaceted strategy or plot. The primary weapon against the American way of life, the primary tool for the destruction of American society, is simply division. All the cracks and weak spots appear when cohesive integrity is undermined, when the threads are separated from one another. Each attack on society has one thing in common how it is used to cause division. People on the right, I think, will look to the left and see them as the enemy, the cause of all this division. But if that's you, I, I beg you to look a little more closely. Those who embrace freedom are now all considered to be on the right, but it's not a monolithic group. Libertarians were once on the left, and then we have constitutionalists, conservatives, Republicans, MAGA Republicans, independents, those with no party affiliation like me. Not to mention those who might be flat earthers or Trump haters or Pence haters or believers in the fall of the cabal. Pretty much every conspiracy theorist. I mean, when not all conspiracies can be true as some are in direct contradiction with each other but they are all on the right. There are military supporters, supporters of our veterans and, and police and firefighter supporters, but also military objectors and people who are anti-establishment, not to mention so-called sovereign citizens. Freedom lovers include homosexuals and pro-abortionists, as well as traditionalists and anti-abortionists and and, and those who support being tough on crime, and those who see the justice system as inherently unjust. Freedom lovers include entrepreneurs and those who have been betrayed by their union, as well as middle-sized businesses who have a tough time intersecting with regulations while turning a profit. There is no monolithic group of freedom lovers. Freedom lovers include atheists, Christians, agnostics, and spiritualists. Freedom lovers include gun enthusiasts and peaceniks. And I think I could go on and on and on and on, but that's how it's done. There are lovers of liberty. There are those who believe in the foundational principles of this country. They believe that a society can be a beautiful tapestry, but they have so successfully divided even this last group of freedom lovers on pretty much every possible, every conceivable level. These people who could all be on the same side of freedom have been convinced to turn against each other, attack each other, and, and seek to avoid being called crazy by refusing to come together on even the single value of liberty. What confuses me at times is that the left is just as divided, but they have been able to convince themselves they are not divided due to, I don't know, intersectionality and the united vision of defeating the crazies on the right. I honestly cannot understand how so many people maintain such a level of cognitive dissonance without losing their minds. I don't know if it's the propaganda by the media, the social media algorithms re reinforcing their mindsets, or the education and advertising they've been exposed to their entire lives. I don't know how they do it. It is just baffling to me 
how so many people are living such conflicted lives, but believing they are in unity. Anyway, each attack on society has one thing in common, how it is used to cause division. The fraying of pop culture. Society was already breaking down. The ease with which its enemies tore the foundation apart during the pandemic was simply evidence that it was already unraveling. But some of this was just regular wear and tear. Media and entertainment were already changing. Outside language and values, there ceased to be any unifying pop culture. Major networks carrying primetime entertainment is a thing of the past. We saw a similar shift with the introduction of cable and satellite television content, but the major networks still garnered most of the viewers. And even those who went to paid subscriptions were watching shows on a weekly basis and forming language and values by finding community with those who shared in the viewing experience. Gone are the days where catchphrases from a show about nothing took hold in a vast swath of America. Like, these pretzels are making me thirsty. No soup for you. Yada, yada, yada. Pop culture is always changing, but the way it is evolving now serves isolation and division instead of community building conversation and debate. I, I also wonder about films that are shown in movie theaters. During the pandemic, that was a thing of the past. Like there was no movie theater going, uh, but even now, if you're not watching the same television, if you're not on the same social media, are you seeing trailers for these movies? I don't know about Hollywood and I don't know how that is transitioning because I haven't gone to the movies in a long time, but I know I also haven't seen a trailer for a movie I wanted to see in a long time. While modern television has always helped shape Americans' ideas about culture and values, with a shift from network and cable television toward almost exclusively streaming services, there can no longer be a conversation on Wednesday about whichever primetime show you watched Tuesday night. We might binge watch the same show as others we meet and maybe even make recommendations, but we are isolating ourselves not only by avoiding actual gatherings, but in our minds through our choices for entertainment. Likewise, we are no longer tuning into the news the same way. Even the older generation is relying more heavily on Twitter, Facebook, and news apps pushing stories to their devices to direct our attention to the current events we ultimately engage with. There are a few diehard fans of CNN and Fox News, even MSNBC, but they are from a generation who are also likely to turn on their local news. We have become so prolific and so diverse, not only in our entertainment choices, but in information sources that those who choose to seek out their own sources will not be able to coalesce around the same stories as those they meet on the street. This even affects how politics is or was framed around entertainment outlets focused on politics. Talk radio was revolutionized by Rush Limbaugh. Love him or hate him, he is gone. His legacy is a few worthy podcasts lost among the vast number of media outlets each of which is vying for its own existence through competing subscriptions. Free political entertainment, once found on AM radio stations, is a thing of the past. No one wants to pay money just to hear what the other side is saying or thinking. And cohesiveness in argument and cohesiveness in attacking arguments died with Rush. No conservative voice has the same reach and unifying influence, and the left can no longer coalesce around a singular representative against whom to target their attacks. We see this also with music. And while the availability of a vast array of genres on demand means everyone can find something they enjoy listening to and or agree with, it means that the percentage of Americans connecting around the same music, the same entertainment, and the same news must necessarily be shrinking exponentially which I understand doesn't make sense because when you shrink exponentially, you, you, you end up at zero, but it must be approaching zero now. Not only has the cultivation of our values been neglected, this lack of unifying pop culture has infiltrated even sports. 
While we might hold on to our personal tribe as fanatics for a particular team or city's franchises of teams, this is a double-edged sword. Sports have always, since the first Olympic Games of the ancient Greeks, been a substitute for war, which lends itself to the idea of winners and losers, as well as to a us versus them mentality, the same way democracy does. The tribalism, though allowing us to identify with a clan of other fans, does little to sharpen debate on any substantive issue, and indeed can bring even more division into the workplace, the family, and the community. And while sports might still be discussed, their popularity has actually waned for several reasons, not the least of which was the politicizing of the last mode of escape from politics. When it comes to pop culture, in fact, instead of unifying the American people, our entertainment industry is actively seeking to divide us. The social dilemma admits to using algorithms that serve to entrench viewers in their positions, convincing them that everyone believes the way they do, and thus radicalizing the defense of those positions, feeding both conspiracy theory and paranoia. Influencers, bloggers, YouTube channels, and social media groups on both the ubiquitous ones and the alternative media also serve to polarize the American public as people will follow and listen to those they already agree with. And the more they follow and listen, the smarter and more logical those positions appear to be and the easier they become to adopt as their own. And instead of unifying around a common culture, there is tribalization that serves to insulate Americans from any viewpoint contrary to their own and encourages those part of the in-group to turn against those in the out-group. Even the streaming services use algorithms to make suggestions and direct the viewer's attention in a very personalized manner, a manner which appears to serve the interests of the viewer, helping them choose their next show. But this also intentionally serves to entrench a polarized view of the world in the mind of the consumer of the content. And this social polarization feeds the desperation voters have immersed themselves in through a belief in democracy, the fear of losing their rights and freedoms. Social polarization thus feeds the political polarization, which in turn feeds the social polarization, creating an ever increasingly divided and irreparable society where isolated consumers turn voters claw and scramble to avoid becoming the oppressed class.